Christian Bryant. If you're second screening right now, meaning you've got the phone and the TV going, that's okay. We just want to be your favorite screen at the moment here. Here's what we got for y'all. With all the talk of new ways to travel to space, astronauts still face an old problem, the isolation of living off planet long term. We're looking at a joint American-Russian experiment that could shed new light. Plus, an ADHD diagnosis can be an easy thing to miss, especially among women. We'll unpack why it matters, but first, our top story. The video game industry is the biggest entertainment industry by revenue in the world, and it's continuing to grow, which means it's increasingly running up against the threat of regulation. Lawmakers and governments around the world are grappling with the influence of the games industry and attempting to influence how video games fit into our lives. This hearing is called to order. In the US, video game regulation efforts came to a head in the 90s when lawmakers fretted that violent video games could affect the behavior of children that played them. Shame on people that produce that trash. It's child abuse in my judgment. The games industry largely escaped regulation in the US by then establishing an independent ratings board. The ESRB is an industry group that labels how child-friendly games are similar to how the MPAA rates movies. Other countries like Germany and Australia still maintain tighter controls on violence in video games. Although violent content is less of a target these days, lawmakers are still expressing fears about the behavioral impacts of video games, specifically what happens when people play too much of them. Gaming disorder, as the World Health Organization has dubbed it, has been legislated against in several countries, including most recently China. The actual research and the harmful effects of prolonged game use is inconclusive at best, but the proposed solutions, government imposed limits on game time, might not be the best way to tackle these problems. It's coming from the perspective that games impact people in a uniform way. Mm -hmm. But we know that that's not the case. Some people use games differently, some use them problematically, some have a harder time regulating than others. Um, so having kind of just a hard and fast rule across the board is ineffective. Rachel Cowart is the research director of Take This, a nonprofit group focused on mental health and games. She argues that banning excessive gaming elides the true causes that prompt overuse. It's not addressing whatever the systemic problem is underneath it. Are people using games problematically because of an underlying anxiety, because of underlying depression, because uh, of a global pandemic that is causing people to play more and, and want to not engage in other areas of their life. Facing scrutiny over the years, video games have gotten better at self-regulating, addressing problems before legislators can crack down on them. One recent concern involved the prevalence of loot boxes in games which lets players pay real money for a random assortment of in-game prizes. That model bears a lot of resemblance to gambling at a slot machine, and regulators were starting to pay attention. Ahead of formal intervention, game platforms started requiring loot box games to publish their odds up front, reducing some of the exploitative potential of the practice. That disclosure has been uh, something that's, uh, that's uh, required at the platform level. And I think that we've also just seen the more kind of egregious of these um, uh, game mechanics uh, simply been taken down in response to, to user uh, pressure in some cases. David Hoppe is the founder and managing partner of Gamma Law, which specializes in video games and technology. He told Newsy the big challenge games are facing is one that many tech industries are struggling with, privacy. Like a lot of other modern tech services, there are a slew of free-to-play video games that make money from collecting player data. Those kinds of services, games and otherwise, are facing backlash from privacy advocates, calling for more legal protections on user data. Perhaps in the next uh, two or three years, we're going to see uh, a sort of national consensus among, uh, among at least uh, larger uh, markets for games in the West uh, with respect to what is and is not acceptable and legal for collection and sharing of uh, user information. Video games regulation is still very much in flux around the world. China's recent clampdown on excessive gaming is one fairly extreme example of how countries are reaching different conclusions about how video games should be controlled. Our reporter Patrick Falk brings us more from Beijing.
When the new rules on how much time minors can spend playing online games were rolled out in August, 17-year-old Ma Yun Hong was one of the many caught by surprise. The big change now is we can only play on weekends, not weekdays. Yun Hong says he used to play a few times a week, spending a couple of hours at it each time. But now under-18s are limited to just three hours play in total per week. Log in outside of designated times when gaming's allowed and the block pops up on your phone advising when play is permitted. I think it's different for everyone as to what they think of the new policies. They are a little overbearing. Authorities introduced the curbs to help address serious concerns in China about addiction to gaming. It's been described by state media as spiritual opium. Reports now say miners have found ways to get around the rules. So what some young gamers are doing is they're going to online trading platforms where they're renting accounts from people who are over 18, allowing them to play the games without restrictions. But having to play catch-up isn't likely to deter policymakers. Yes, as you say, it's a bit of whack-a-mole. Right. The screws have continuously tightened over the last 20 years and every new regulatory wave has built on the one before it. So when you go back 20 years ago, there weren't any real name registration rules. There was no technology or system that the regulators controlled that would allow them to see the age of somebody logging into a game. They have since built those systems. Online gaming limits aren't the only example of the government having a bigger say on what young people can and can't do. Recently, steps were taken into rain in celebrity culture, blamed for polluting society and youths. Authorities are clamping down on the idolizing of stars, barring platforms from publishing things like popularity rankings and regulating merchandise sales. Even private tutoring has been targeted. Classes are barred on weekends and holidays to ease pressure on students. There's always going to be a question of overreach. Uh, will they cross the line? I'm sure they will for many people. The question is, how do they react to it? Um, you know, there's a difference between choices and principles. But as the Chinese government steps up its campaign to assert its ideological and political principles across all walks of society, many fear room for people's private lives may become increasingly narrow. Patrick Falk for Newsy, Beijing. Much appreciated to Patrick Falk for that reporting from Beijing. When you're back, we're breaking our own screen time restrictions to tell you what's trending on social. While folks on Twitter have been busy trying to figure out the red flag trend or how to mute those messages, we were hard at work excavating trending topics on social you might want to know a little bit about, shall we? NBA champion and Brooklyn Nets point guard Kyrie Irving has been benched by his team indefinitely after a pretty high profile standoff over his refusal to get a COVID-19 vaccination. Nets general manager Sean Mark said in a statement, Kyrie has made a personal choice and we respect his individual right to choose. Currently, the choice restricts his ability to be a full-time member of the team, and we will not permit any member of our team to participate with part-time availability. In New York City, you have to show proof of vaccination to enter indoor entertainment venues like sports arenas, even if you got handles out the wazoo. Irving is one of many players around the league who push back on vaccine requirements, but is likely the most high-profile player to have to sit because of his choice not to get vaccinated. Irving will not be paid for games he misses, which would be two preseason games and 43 regular season games. At $380,000 per game, I'll let y'all do the math. Former NFL head coach John Gruden's resignation from the Las Vegas Raiders this week has gotten a lot of attention, and rightfully so, considering some of the racist, homophobic, and misogynistic things he wrote in emails to a former president of the Washington football team. But, Let's not forget that those emails are a part of a larger investigation into misconduct within the as yet named football club in the nation's capital. And the NFL Players Association wants to know more. The NFLPA wants the NFL to release the rest of the 650,000 emails that are a part of their year long investigation into sexual harassment claims from former employees. The league's investigation ended with the Washington football team being fined $10 million 
and team leadership being mandated workplace misconduct training. The NFL has already said it ain't releasing more details on the investigation, but they actually didn't release any in the first place. We only know about Gruden's emails thanks to leaks and reporting, and who knows what else we might find in that batch of hundreds of thousands of emails. A city in Michigan is having a water crisis. We've heard this before in Flint, but this time it's happening in a place called Benton Harbor. The thing is, this isn't exactly new news. Back in 2018, the city was found to have concerningly high levels of lead contamination in the water. No amount of lead in water is safe, but in Benton Harbor, it was way over the federal action level. Recently, residents have been told not to drink the tap water or use it for cooking or bathing out of an abundance of caution. Water drives have become a normal thing around the city. Many people felt ignored by the state, so last month, several organizations filed an emergency appeal to the Environmental Protection Agency after they felt not enough was being done to address the situation. Activists say the EPA's involvement has helped push things forward. Several organizations pledged to work to give all homes in the city a water filter. Longer term, the governor proposed $20 million to replace all the lead lines over the next five years, but the plan hasn't been approved and it's still unclear where that funding will come from. A new record set today for the oldest man to blast off into space. 90-year-old William Shatner took part in Blue Origin's latest launch. I'm not gonna lie, I was worried about how he took that landing. That looked pretty rough but all is well and he seemed pretty pumped about it. The vulnerability of everything, it's so small. This air, which is keeping us alive, is, is thinner than your skin. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sliver, it's, it's immeasurably small when you think in terms of the, of the universe. Here at ITL, we love to talk about the final frontier. While these recent launches we've seen are quick round trips out of this world and back, some astronauts spend a lot longer in space. To better understand how isolation impacts spaceflight participants, NASA's Human Research Laboratory and the Russian Academy of Sciences are running an experiment in Moscow. Two Americans, three Russians, and one Emirate will live in a mock-up space station for eight months to perform experiments, and see how they work as a crew. Stuart Smith has more from Moscow. Three, two, one, and fast run. The race is on to get humans once again past low Earth orbit, but to do so, scientists need to know how human physiology and team psychology will impact the mission. The Sirius 21 project will keep the feet of its crew firmly on the ground, but the data they record will be used to inform the flights of the future. Ahead. Ashley Kowalski will be the crew's engineer. She has experience in the US aerospace industry and hopes her participation will give her a better chance to one day get into space herself. You come into your kitchen, you know, this is where we'll have our breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks. Um, you see it's pretty cozy, there'll be six of us here. Um, all the food that we eat is going to be um, food that can have a long shelf life, essentially. So, you know, dried out foods or vacuum sealed foods. This one is actually going to be my room. <laughs> um, so as you can see, you know, each one of us has our own desk, bed. We've got storage area under here, more storage area here. Um, there are different lighting modes that we can change here. So depending on our mood, we can change it to different uh, ambiance. They'll give us surveys saying like, okay, well, how did, you, how did you feel after doing this task today? Or, you know, are you, having, are you in conflict with Mission Control Center today? Did you have, you know, feelings of you know, distress? Are you happy? Are you sad? None of us know how we're actually going to react once we're in isolation. I think this is a new uh, environment for all of us. And so, yeah, I'm a little bit nervous, <laughs> but, um, but also just, just really excited for what the eight ones are going to bring. They'll be simulating a theoretical mission to the moon, but the data on how their bodies and minds react will be useful for all future crewed missions, such as to Mars. In command of Sirius 21 will be ex-cosmonaut candidate Oleg Blinov. I really want this experiment to provide a full understanding of what deep space flight is like and work out all the details of near-Earth and suborbital flights. It's from here at Mission Control. Engineers can monitor the life support systems, researchers can allocate the daily tasks, and program directors can watch the participants throughout the mission. 
It's been used many times before for these types of isolation experiments, such as for the multi-crewed 520-day long Mars 500 mission from 2017 to 2011. It also hosted the first serious mission, which was four months long, but there's still a lot to learn. The HRP program is interested primarily in uh, the psychology area, uh, interaction, crew interaction uh, within the crew as well as interaction with uh, the mission control center, the multi-cultural, uh, multi-gender aspect of the crew composition, uh, the effects of isolation on cognitive skills, on stress, stress resilience, uh, stress biomarkers. And he believes running those experiments with a mixed US-Russia crew provides multiple benefits. That's a very important component, of course. We fly together, we uh, like to conduct research together whenever that's practical, whenever it makes sense. So uh, uh, both uh, sides have a great deal of, uh, again, expertise. The team will be experiencing a level of isolation much higher than the crew on the International Space Station, with fewer opportunities to contact friends and family, and no view of the world outside. All this to learn how to mitigate and counteract any potential problems on future missions. In three weeks' time, this door will be shut for the last time. It'll be June 2022 before participants see sunlight again. Stuart Smith for Newsy, Moscow. Man, eight months and you don't even go to outer space? I don't know if I could do that. It's fun to think about what's beyond our planet. But after the break, we're bringing you right back down to Earth to talk about the reality of the climate change problems we've got going on. Sunday nights, Newsy takes you to the edge. Exploring untold stories. It's literally an existential threat. Going far beyond the headlines. Today, social media is the real world. Hey, grandkids. There needs to be a bridging of the gap. In real life, a next generation news magazine. New episodes, Sunday nights at 8.30, 7.30 Central, only on Newsy. Thanks to climate change, weather disasters are happening so frequently it's hard to keep up. And it's not just something you might be seeing on the news. Many of you have actually experienced severe storms, wildfires, hurricanes, etc. for the first time these past couple of years. Nearly one in three Americans experienced a weather disaster this summer. So for a lot of us, we've had to start thinking more seriously about what happens if or when a disaster hits. Newsy partnered with the video team at the Washington Post to break down how we can prepare for a climate disaster. Some of us only just hear about extreme disasters in the news. We are looking at imminent landfall of this storm. Others have lived through it. It was rough. I heard noises that I will never forget. In just the summer of 2021, nearly one in three Americans experienced a weather disaster. And with the planet warming and more extreme weather events occurring, it won't be too long until more of us will have to go through it too. The climate is getting more hostile, and today the UN said it is already too late to stop some of the devastating impacts of climate change. It's not if a disaster will strike, it's when. I mean, look at what happened in New York and New Jersey. So being prepared can be the thing that saves your life and even some of your things. You can do things like sign up for alerts on your phone or pack a go bag. There are accessible resources like ready.gov that will have a more in-depth checklist of things you can do to prepare. But checking off items is the easy part. It's the leaving your home and possibly losing what you left behind that takes an emotional toll no one has ever really prepared for. As you can see, it's like there's just a lot of stuff and it, I don't know, you just kind of leave hoping that it'll all be okay. This is Jenny Waldo. She's had to evacuate from Hurricanes Harvey, Katrina, and Ike. The family photos are right here. The kids, friends and stuff, family. It would be sad to lose it, you know? For me, when I think about it, it's not so much just the sentimental stuff that you lose, but it's also just the the inconvenience and the, the stress of, of all the little things. Like when we were Katrina evacuees, like we were really lucky because my husband's job put us up in um, like corporate housing. So 
like it was a furnished apartment, but we didn't have plates and we didn't have pots and pans and we didn't have forks. When we were driving with my kids, you know, there was just that really stark feeling of, you know, the only thing that matters is, is us, you know, it's like your life and your kids' lives and, you know, that kind of stuff, so. I have spent my entire life taking care of these animals and it felt like um, leaving them, abandoning them would be like the captain leaving a ship as it sank and that's just not something you do. This is Megan Brown. She's a sixth generation rancher in Northern California and she's had to evacuate from several wildfires. There he is, there's my big boy. Oh, it's so hot, it's so hot. Hi, bub. Really just making sure that they're okay was my first priority. Like my house could have burned down, that would have been fine, but as long as the animals were okay, that was, that's what I was most worried about. And when I watched the fire engulf the ranch, I could see things that I thought was the barn catch on fire, and that's when I absolutely just started losing it. Then the next morning I saw, saw that it was still here, and it was so exciting. Um, I've never been so happy in my life. Recovering after disaster is probably the hardest step physically, emotionally, and financially. For Brown, the Cherokee fire in 2017 caused the most damage to her property, $4 million worth of damage. While you can't always predict when disaster will strike and how much you'll lose, here are some actionable steps you can start taking today. First things first, pack an emergency go bag. Everyone's bag will look a little different, but should contain the same essentials. A three-day supply of water. Typically, this means a gallon per day per person. A three-day supply of food. This should be non-perishable foods like canned goods or cereal bars. Blankets and pillows. Keep these in sealed Ziploc bags so they don't get wet. Seasonal comfortable clothing. You'll need a change of clothes, but the type of clothing will be different depending on where you are. Tools, flashlights, and a radio. Pack extra batteries while you're at it, too. Extra cash, important documents, and first aid kits. Make sure to keep the cash and documents in Ziploc bags. Any documents or family photos you can't carry, you should upload online. Or look into keeping them in a safety deposit box. Personal hygiene and health items. And any prescriptions you'll need. Entertainment. If you're evacuated for long periods of time, you're going to get bored. So bring a book. If you have kids, bring some toys too. But, of course, a backpack won't be able to fit everything you own. There's always the risk that you will lose some of your possessions. So be sure to check your insurance policy and see exactly what it covers. For example, you may need to enroll in extra policies like flood insurance, especially if you're in a flood-prone area. And before the disaster, take stock of everything you own. The easiest way to do this is to take photos of your entire house, so that if it comes to the point in which you need to file a loss claim to your insurance company, you can itemize exactly what was lost. And if you own a home, make sure to maintain the property. Keep the gutters clean, know how to turn the water and gas off, or when you renovate, consider also making safety improvements like fire-resistant roofing. And after you do what you need to do to prepare, tell a friend or a neighbor, so that we may all be a little bit more prepared today than we were yesterday. When we come back, we're taking a deep dive into the surprisingly common chronic condition that many adult women are finding out they've had all along. That's up next. Here's a question. Do you know any women in your life who were diagnosed with ADHD as adults? Or maybe somebody who thinks they could have ADHD but aren't sure? Now, there are plenty of people who kid about, let's say, having a short attention span, which is a symptom, but we mean like actual diagnosed ADHD. Research says many women with ADHD go well into adulthood without ever being diagnosed. That kind of missed diagnosis can lead to some pretty serious outcomes in adulthood. And it all largely stems from some misconceptions around ADHD in young boys and girls and it's the perfect time to talk about it since it's ADHD Awareness Month. Boys with ADHD typically get diagnosed around seven years old when they're hyperactive and maybe being disruptive in class or something. And historically, white boys were the demographic most likely to be diagnosed. But symptoms of ADHD in girls tend to look a lot different. Girls with ADHD are more likely to be inattentive, easily distracted, and lost in their thoughts rather than hyperactive. CDC data shows that 12.9% of boys will be diagnosed compared to 5.6% of girls. 
For adults, it's 5.4% of men and 3.2% of women. And by the way, most of this research focuses on ADHD in cisgender men and women, meaning the focus is on folks who identify with their sex assigned at birth. Dr. Ellen Littman has been studying ADHD in women and girls for the past 30 years. She says new research shows ADHD symptoms in women are related to hormones and that those tend to fluctuate. Women's symptoms don't, uh, girls' symptoms don't really start um, becoming obvious if you're not very hyperactive until estrogen hits your system. So everyone looks pretty good when they're like 11 uh, years old, you know, nine to 11, and all the smart girls are like, they're having no problems in school and they look great, maybe a little passive, but otherwise they look great. And then suddenly, puberty comes in and suddenly they have symptoms, all kinds of symptoms that they didn't have before. That helps explain why many women are being diagnosed with ADHD later in life. They typically miss the window when most children are evaluated. That really matters because ADHD can contribute to anxiety, depression, and symptoms can lead to things like difficulties at work, money trouble, relationship issues, and even frequent fender benders. What we're finding is that the outcomes, especially for women who do have impulsivity, are extremely negative and much more negative than uh, boys and men. So we're finding that they are five times more likely to self-harm. Um, and four times more likely than, uh, than either uh, boys and men or control um, women uh, to uh, attempt suicide. Um, and they are more likely to have um, violence in their relationships. All those risks really just underscore why it's so important to get support. Experts say getting a formal diagnosis and working with professionals on how to work through it is the best way to go. Dr. Lucrece Rupert is a psychiatrist who works with children with ADHD. She also says she has ADHD herself, but that she didn't discover it until she was in medical school, which just goes to show how common this really is. To get your medical license, you have to take a test called step three, which is two days. It's two days, it's um, eight hours one day, and I think six hours the next day. And you have to take a lot of tests before that, but that's uh, the last one to get just your general medical license. Um, and I failed it and I had like, never failed anything in my life. And I was just like, yeah, I absolutely cannot sit for two days and focus, you know, through an eight hour test and then a six hour, six hour test. Um, so that that's what finally prompted me to be officially diagnosed or officially um, evaluated. Now we turn to Newsy's Casey Mendoza, who gives us a personal look into evaluating ADHD as an adult. ADHD has long been associated with childhood development and this idea that kids could grow out of it in adulthood. But the truth is that ADHD never really goes away and it's never too late to seek a diagnosis. I work with people of all ages from preschool, well, mostly school age, all the way through people in retirement. Researchers found that ADHD diagnoses among adults more than doubled over the past decade, growing four times faster than ADHD diagnoses in children in the United States. And I didn't get diagnosed until I was 25 when I was in grad school. Over the past couple of months, I've been wondering if I'm one of those adults. You, you can almost see the light bulb come on. And once, once you start to learn about it, things start to click. Things that didn't make sense before start to make sense now. My aha moments happened every time I learned more about specific symptoms of ADHD, like time blindness, where 10 minutes, one hour, and vice versa can feel the same to me, or hyperfixation, where I can get easily immersed in one thing for hours, even though I get easily distracted by anything else. There's an old joke about ADHD that the only consistent thing about ADHD is inconsistency. Now let's make one thing clear. Everyone gets distracted and everyone procrastinates. But for people with ADHD, the inability to regulate attention constantly gets in the way of life. And for adults who are untreated, it can manifest in anxiety and depression, both things that I've lived with for years. And it's because of that I wanted to learn more. What does a diagnostic test look like? Like how does a person get diagnosed with ADHD now? Uh, very good question. Uh, there is no one test for ADHD. 
but the most powerful diagnostic indicator is a lifetime pattern of history. For adults, common ADHD symptoms include more difficulty with time management at work, poor listening skills in relationships, and low frustration tolerance. Because folks may not have the best recollection of when they're young, it is usually standard of care to try to get multiple different folks kind of input. So that could be from a parent, that can be from a spouse, that can be um, from a teacher or coach. For women, it's also important to keep in mind that ADHD can look different. As young girls, they were more likely than boys to seem inattentive rather than hyperactive, and they were more likely to develop organizational coping mechanisms, like using planners. This was thought that maybe 90%, ADHD was 90% boys, 10% girls. This is not true. Uh, another common misconception is that uh, if you're successful in life, you can't have ADHD. It's just complete nonsense. Olympic gymnast Simone Biles, musician Dave Grohl, and actress Emma Watson are examples of successful people with ADHD. And human beings are so incredible. I think we underestimate our ability to adapt. Uh, I work with people with ADHD in almost any occupation you can think of, and people do well. More people are seeing through the past misconceptions of ADHD, especially as more adults speak up about their experiences online. And with this better knowledge of what ADHD is, new telehealth companies like Dunn, Ahead, and Circle are making it easier to find help online. Dunn and Ahead start off with basic quizzes and questions like, how often do you avoid or delay getting started on a task? Very often. <laughs> Did you say all the time? These quick questionnaires are pretty simple, but they're just the first step. The bigger part of the process is an appointment with a clinician, remote or in person, who can assess their patient's history and the extent to which their distractibility affects their lives. Many people's lives change profoundly once they identify the ADHD and learn more and learn how to deal with it. For a lot of adults struggling with the symptoms of ADHD, there is a sense of hope and optimism in an ADHD diagnosis, and the potential learn more about how to manage it. Casey Mendoza, DZ, Chicago. We've talked about vaccines on the show more times than I can count. After the break, we're talking vaccine mandates, vaccine development, and vaccines for kids. That's a lot of shots. Newsy tonight is changing the conversation. Incredible footage coming in live right now. Away from opinions and arguments. Tell our viewers how people there are preparing for the next extreme weather event. Primetime news focused on facts, understanding. This is an investigation you will only see here tonight. Reporting what matters and why it matters to you. We're not really as divided as it may seem. Let's break down our latest Newsy poll. Newsy tonight, weeknights at 8, 7 central, only on Newsy. So far, the COVID vaccines have been unchanged since they were first rolled out almost a year ago. Whether it's a first dose, second dose, or a booster, it's been the same shot with the same formula. COVID evolves more slowly than other illnesses like the flu, but it still changes as it spreads. And while the current vaccines protect against severe disease and death, that evolution makes it difficult for the original vaccines to provide full protection from illness. But experts are already looking to prepare the next generation of COVID vaccines to help them prevent infection from Delta and potentially any future variants. Newsy's national correspondent Usher Qureshi has more. One thing we've learned about fighting a pandemic is that as a virus circulates amongst the unvaccinated, more infectious variants like Delta can emerge. And while initial data suggests the current crop of vaccines remain highly effective, scientists around the world are trying to create a universal vaccine that could protect against emerging variants and possibly prevent future coronavirus pandemics. These vaccines that we have right now are tremendously effective. They have saved millions of lives. But the question is, can we make them better? What is this? It's a question scientists like microbiologist and immunologist Pablo Penaloza McMaster are trying to crack different variants and even different strains of coronaviruses express, they, they mutate their spike or code protein so that they can deceive the immune system. 
He says the spike protein, the outer structure responsible for viral entry into the host cell, is what the current crop of vaccines target. But because of its ability to mutate and outfox the immune system, it's also a moving target. So we're trying to find other targets that we could teach the immune system how to work on, like uh, this protein which is expressed in the inside of the virus is called the nucleocapsid. He and his team recently published a study showing that targeting not only the spike protein, but also the inner guts of the virus could provide broader protection and help prevent breakthrough cases as well. These are responses that could recognize different coronaviruses, not only SARS-CoV-2. They also wanted to test for cross protections. They immunized mice against the 2004 strain of SARS-CoV-1 to see if that would offer any protection from SARS-CoV-2. To our surprise, we saw that the mice were also protected from SARS-CoV-2. So that shows it's a proof of concept that a SARS-1 vaccine could not only protect against SARS-1, but also SARS-2. COVID-19 is just one of seven known human coronaviruses. And with more of these viruses likely to jump into the human population in the coming years, a vaccine development foundation out of Norway is giving $200 million to scientists who are working on a universal vaccine. It's taking applications until the end of this month. I think one realistic outcome is that we could develop at least one prototypical vaccine that protects against multiple coronaviruses. Researchers at the University of California, Irvine, UNC Chapel Hill, and the University of Virginia are already testing or studying universal protection. It's a quest to develop one shot to rule them all. I'm Usher Qureshi reporting. Many thanks to Usher for that piece. There's a bunch of different COVID treatments and vaccines in development. One potentially major change coming is the rollout of vaccines for younger kids. Last week, Pfizer and BioNTech asked the FDA to authorize its COVID vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. If it's approved, kids could be getting shots in the next few weeks. But before any vaccine is approved, it needs to go through trials with thousands and thousands of people. Newsy national correspondent Dan Grossman has more on how some of those could be happening at hospitals in our very own backyards. This is the family. If the last 10 years have taught Rachel Brewer anything. These are my three girls. This is Charlie, who is now seven. This is Ellie, who's now eight, and this is Sydney, who is now 10. It's that motherhood can be a trial unto itself. The older one, the 10-year-old Sydney, I would tell you she's the rule follower, and the middle one is the more emotional one, but also just the scrappy go-getter. And then the third one is, um, whilst has a very lively personality, can be a little bit of the instigator. Three girls loved equally and eternally. That's exactly, for sure. No, they're, they're quite entertaining. So she figured, if we're already doing this trial, what's the harm in one more. Knowing that my kids did this on a voluntary basis and they even signed their own consent um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a kid level, um, seeing them do that was a pretty cool feeling knowing that again they're willing to be part of science and the process. In July, Rachel signed her two older daughters up for the COVID-19 vaccine trials. They'd go in and get a shot that was either the vaccine or a placebo and with periodic check-ins each week, they'd monitor any side effects between doses. It's just a moment of wow, like this is really cool that we're doing something um, to, to get through the, the pandemic. The mother in Rachel was calm because the doctor in her knew these trials had already gone through extensive research to get to this phase in the first place. This is like any other medical process and very much what we learn in medical school about how to navigate that um, safely, whether it's a vaccine or a medicine or a brace or orthotic. I mean, there's so many different things that we think about and how to make it safe. And this is just the exact same process as every one of them. A recent survey published in the American Academy of Pediatrics shows Rachel is in the minority. Out of more than 1,700 parents questioned on the likelihood of their kids getting vaccinated. 28% said they were very likely and 18% said they were somewhat likely, while 33% were very unlikely and 21% were either somewhat unlikely or unsure. You know, most of the time when these trials are approved nationally, uh, that safety piece is pretty well worked out. Dr. Ian Kaminsky finds the numbers interesting. He's taken part in more than 20 medical trials and says the process is rigorous as it involves months, if not years, of permits and qualification checks. The difference in the COVID vaccine, he says, is that it involves mRNA, something that's been researched for the better part of the last two decades. I, I think the time that they took for it uh, didn't feel rushed to me given the amount of research that had already happened in that arena 
in the many years prior. According to Pfizer, the trials included more than 4,500 kids ages 6 months to 11 years, twice the number of people that were involved in the teen vaccination trials. They were also given a lower dose than adults, 10 micrograms instead of 30 to ensure health and safety. You know, honestly, my kids were excited about taking part in something like this. So far, no side effects in Rachel's kids, even though Pfizer has said the known ones mirror those found in adults. Just a level of bragging rights with their friends. Um, I heard from their friends while they're part of that. That's really cool. I want to do that. Um, and that was really neat to see, too. I'm Dan Grossman. Are you on your phone right now? Or are you more of a laptop or iPad person? Either way, help us get the word out about what we're doing here. Let all your friends know you're watching by posting on social media with the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. And stay with us when we're closing the loop after the break. What do you think the future looks like? From Newsy, renowned journalists and filmmakers comes a celebration of storytelling. Are we in a killer robots arms race right now? When the suspect admits to it, I'm not going to argue the, the law with you. <sighs> New features every week. Newsy Docs presents Sunday nights at 9, 8 central, only on Newsy. Our time together is almost over until tomorrow, but if you are just now tuning in, let me loop you in on our top stories. The video game industry is the biggest entertainment industry by revenue in the world, and it's continuing to grow, which means it's increasingly running up against the threat of regulation. In the US, video game regulation efforts came to a head in the 90s, when lawmakers fretted that violent video games could affect the behavior of children that played them. Although violent content is less of a target these days, Lawmakers are still expressing fears about the behavioral impacts of video games, specifically what happens when people play too much of them. The actual research and the harmful effects of prolonged game use is inconclusive at best, but the proposed solutions, government-imposed limits on game time, might not be the best way to tackle these problems. It's coming from the perspective that games impact people in a uniform way. Mm -hmm. But we know that that's not the case. Some people use games differently, some use them problematically, some have a harder time regulating than others. Um, so having kind of just a hard and fast rule across the board is ineffective. Facing scrutiny over the years, video games have gotten better at self-regulating. Video games regulation is still very much in flux around the world. China's recent clampdown on excessive gaming is one fairly extreme example of how countries are reaching different conclusions about how video games should be controlled. Research says many women with ADHD go well into adulthood without ever being diagnosed. That kind of missed diagnosis can lead to some pretty serious outcomes in adulthood. And it all largely stems from some misconceptions around ADHD in young boys and girls. And it's the perfect time to talk about it since it's ADHD Awareness Month. Boys with ADHD typically get diagnosed around seven years old when they're hyperactive and maybe being disruptive in class or something. And historically, white boys were the demographic most likely to be diagnosed. But symptoms of ADHD in girls tend to look a lot different. Girls with ADHD are more likely to be inattentive, easily distracted, and lost in their thoughts rather than hyperactive. What we're finding is that the outcomes especially for women who do have impulsivity, are extremely negative and much more negative than uh, boys and men. So we're finding that they are five times more likely to self-harm. Okay, folks, that's all we have for tonight. But don't worry, we'll be back tomorrow with more In The Loop. Stay with us. Evening Debrief is up next.